Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Hello and welcome to the London part of the show. I'm Jo Coburn. Joining me for the duration of the programme, Rishanara Ali, Labour MP for Bethnal Green and Bow, and the Conservative MP for Beckenham, Bob Stewart. Welcome to both of you. I want to begin with the news that another Labour politician has announced she is standing down. Heidi Alexander, MP for Lewisham East, is joining the team at City Hall to become Deputy Mayor for Transport. Rishanara, why isn't it a desirable job anymore to be a Labour MP? Well, it is a desirable job, but Heidi's been given this incredible opportunity to be Deputy Mayor for London, so she's decided that uh, she would like to pursue uh, that role, and I think it's fantastic. She's a, we're going to miss her very much in Westminster, but I'm delighted that she'll be in City Hall, and as a London MP, she's a fantastic addition to Sadiq Khan's team but working really, on she's, transport. She's following a number of your and her colleagues, Tristram Hunt, Jamie Reid, they've actually left politics um, altogether, and then you have Dan Jarvis and Andy Burnham, who've become mayors. Do you think there is a strand of thought within the Labour Party or a number of MPs who just don't feel they're going to flourish under Jeremy Corbyn? I think that's unfair, actually, because each of these choices are, are, are different. And, you you know, the, the um, move towards people going off to be mayors, for instance, is, is about wanting to make a difference in the regions that, that they're from. Uh, they want to get there, you know, get, get stuck into the job of delivery. And to some extent, it's a function of us being an opposition, actually, because, you know, we all go, we want to, we went into politics to make a difference. And it's, you know, there's no question that it's far frustration, frustrating being in opposition. So if you've got an opportunity to get into government, whether it's uh, City Hall or being a mayor in, a, in another region, then it, it is, uh, it is inevitable that people are going to want to take up some of those roles. And I think it's fantastic that we've got so many uh, colleagues who are going into those roles. Uh, obviously, I don't want them all to uh, start departing Westminster. I mean, are you worried about that? I mean, can you flourish under Jeremy Corbyn? Well, look, I'm really proud to represent my constituency, which I uh, won back in 2010 from George Galloway's party. Uh, and I really love my job. I feel incredibly privileged to be able to be a member of parliament. But are you so I have no, no intention and... of not continuing to do that job. And can you flourish? Can your career flourish under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership? Well, I've, I've been working very hard uh, in my role as a Member of Parliament uh, and I will continue to do so. I mean, Bob, when we're talking about Lewisham, um, Heidi Alexander's uh, seat, I mean, there's no chance for the Conservatives anyway there, is there? Absolutely clear that we will win that seat. No doubt about it. Based on what? based on the fact I've just said so. Right. But the <laughs> no answer is, evidence. you are probably right. There is no <laughs> chance there. I mean, she's got a majority of something like 26,000. 20, it's a significant, but, I mean, it's a significant but frank, majority. Frankly, right. uh, there will be a heck of a lot of people in the Labour Party that would like that seat. So watch the scramble. All right, we'll leave it there. <laughs> now, London is in the middle of an epidemic of violent crime. The police the mayor's office and Londoners are desperate for a solution to end the bloodshed. But what is being done? Sebastian Ash has more. First knife crime victim shot dead while playing football. 15th teenager to die on London streets. Another violent week in London. It's a story that's become all too common. Another stabbing, another shooting on London streets. So far this year, more than 60 people have been murdered in the capital, over half of them under the age of 25. Many more have been injured. The debate rages on about the causes of this upsurge in violence. City Hall point to the impact of police funding cuts by central government and cuts to youth services, but they say they will plug the gap. The mayor's also um, announced a Young Londoners Fund to ensure that we're not just looking at how do we tackle this violence through enforcement, because the police can't do this alone, but we're putting in the programmes and projects that will enable young people not to get involved in crime and violence. You know, you know what's going on here, just as much as I do, don't you? As violent crime rises, City Hall has also pledged to increase the use of intelligence-led stop and search. Really good to see. How are you? Something the mayor had previously promised to reduce. Londoners will be following closely to see what impact that has. 
Joining me, Dr Anthony Gunter, a criminologist from the University of East London and Liberal Democrat peer Lord Paddock, former Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Welcome to both of you and of course my other guests are here too. Anthony, can I start with you first of all? Have local communities been forgotten by politicians? Most certainly. There's no votes in it uh, for them so you're seeing the effects of long-term neglect in terms of this issue as far as I'm concerned. Right. Do you see that, Rishan? Are there no votes in it for Sadiq Khan and so it's not worth actually grabbing grappling this issue? I don't, I don't agree with that, but I do think that, uh, you know, the, the uh, epidemic that has t is taken hold of um, crime, particularly knife crime, is a massive issue and we need national government investment working with uh, local authorities and um, London, the London mayor and that is, you know, we're not going to address this issue until we have resources but also proper partnership between the different agencies including local communities but there's a, there's a lot of fear at the moment and understandable fear given, given what's happening. Right, what do you say about it being just about the issue of investment uh, at a national level? Well, first of all, it is an epidemic. This has been an ongoing issue for a number of years now, over a decade. And it is about a lack of investment in education, in, in housing um, and support for young people. I mean, what you're seeing is these young people who live in a twilight world, who have forgotten about, have no future. And the way they seem to make sense of their life is by engaging in, in violence and almost like film scripts. Um, that, that Their world is, is almost like a Hollywood movie almost. Right. That's what we're seeing. So these are the causes and national investment and more resources from your government would help deal with the causes? Well, it, I hope so. I mean, let, let us try. It's not just as simple as that. Obviously, it's, it's an extremely complicated thing. Why are people carrying more weapons? Why are um, more young people being killed these days? It's, I agree it's part of what you just said, Professor. I agree with that. Um, but I'm just wondering, what sort of investment do we want? We, we, we really would like to see an immediate, immediate result, but I don't know how you can get an immediate result. You can start off by increasing police numbers. We've seen nationally a reduction by 21,000, and I've seen a third of police officers reduced in my own constituency, and that has direct consequences do and fatalities. Do you accept that has direct yeah, consequences? Yeah, I mean, of course, police, having more policemen on the streets would help. Yeah, and right. so it would be very nice to have more policemen, if we can. Right, and you would agree with that, Brian? I think community policing yeah. is where we need to invest. That's not just increasing the number of police officers, but the number of police community support officers yeah. who were the sort of the ones that <coughs> didn't carry the tasers and the CS spray and all the rest of it, who were the real bridge between communities and mm -hmm. police officers mm -hmm. who were increasingly looking like Robocop. Um, they have been completely decimated. Yeah. I was talking to a former commissioner only yesterday who was saying that they've just wiped out the PCSOs mm -hmm. in London and they were the people who would build a trust and confidence amongst communities with the police which leads to intelligence about who the knife carriers are and therefore the targeting of stop and search more accurately. Right, so who is accountable for that, Roshanara? Well, it's the national government. They but made what about the cuts the and Boris Khan? Johnson, hello, um, Boris Johnson was in power for eight years. He was behind these cuts with national government. Sadiq's been in power in the last two years and so the, the Tory government assigning blame on the new mayor when all those cuts were instituted by the previous mayor and the national government is disingenuous. And you, but we need you, to move, move on and deal with the problem. What do you think about the blame game that goes on yeah. here? Um, you know, you speak to the Conservative and Labour politicians, particularly in this case, they blame the previous sure. administration rather than looking to themselves. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a political football, this issue of, of knife crime. The, the whole political class is culpable for this issue. Uh, they, they haven't taken it seriously. Yes, police numbers is one of the, one of the issues, but actually looking at the problem that, uh, that these communities are facing from, from a holistic perspective, this is a public health issue. And rather than focusing on policing numbers, we should be saying, how do we join things up with regards to health, education, to, to, to say, look, Violence is a, is a public health issue. Let's get educators and, and community together to, to, to deal with this. Right, and a little bit like the situation in Glasgow. In fact, we have on this programme talked about looking at the example there where they did have sure. a sort of zero tolerance but, attitude yeah. and looked at the public health side. But Glasgow, I mean, is, is police led. I mean, it's a World, World Health Organisation initiative public health um, agenda, which the police play a secondary role, they're not a lead role. Um, and that's what we should be looking at with this. Right, and you talk about Roshanara blaming uh, Boris Johnson 
Johnson, the previous uh, Conservative mayor. But the current mayor of London, with a huge personal mandate mm -hmm. in British politics, with this happening on his watch in his city, how much responsibility rests on his shoulders? Well, he is taking responsibility. How? He's allocated, he's allocated funding, 40 million in youth provision. Uh, he's also uh, providing additional support to the police. But the government decided not to increase spending in the police force, despite the Met chief campaign, you know, making the case with the mayor of London and members of parliament. Those messages fell on deaf ears. So we'll keep trying. Sadiq Khan and the rest of the London MPs will keep trying to apply pressure on the government to increase the budget, policing budget. But the idea that the national government is listening is laughable. And we really need them to listen to the concerns of Londoners and the Mayor of London right. when he consistently makes that, that representation for extra resources. Brian, how much responsibility do you think? I mean, you're a former uh, police officer uh, and, you know, you've seen the political situation. How much does rest? on the current Mayor of London? Well, 60% nationally of police funding comes from central government, only 40% from local government. So that puts, you know, 60-40 where the blame lies in terms of reduction in, in police numbers. But also what you've got to look at is the reduction in funding for local authorities. Yeah. People, these young people are going into gangs because they want to belong to a family. They want to, to, to belong to, to a, a, a group. You've got to provide an alternative, a, a positive gang for them to belong to. So you've got to invest in youth clubs, you've got to invest in activities so that they don't get drawn into these violent gangs. I mean, Bob, investment we've talked about, we've also just listened uh, to Brian, they're saying cuts to local services and local authorities have contributed to this situation. Do you think if the victims were more often white, politicians would listen more? No, I hope, I hope not. I hope it's just exactly the same, but you're smiling. I, I hope not. I mean, I have not, I'm not actually blaming anyone. I just think we should actually get it sorted. And I think we need to have a, a political consensus on this. We need to have consensus all the way down because this is mm. clearly a problem. Do not blame anyone. Let's actually try and get together. Got to be account but someone has got to be accountable. Well, I mean, there the, the mayor of London is accountable because he runs the police you've in London. you just admitted there's not enough investment at a national level. Yeah. You would like to see more police yeah, of officers course. on the street. That must be a national government uh, responsibility. Yes. Um, and looking at cuts to local authorities, they claim they've been stripped to the bone. Yep. So whose fault is it? Well, I mean, the government is not trying does not want to cut down on these things. It just hasn't got the money. Can I just make the... True. Taking up mm -hmm. what you've just said, Joe, about black and white, I think the more pertinent question is, if conservative voting parents' children start being murdered, as we are beginning to see as county lines, the exporting of the drug market mm. to uh, surrounding suburbs, and it starts affecting conservative voters, then the conservative government will make it take it more seriously. Look, this, I need, we need to get away from this idea of gangs and drugs. Look, this violence is a lot more complex than, than this simplistic policing, drugs, county lines nonsense, as far as I'm concerned. You know, young people are carrying knives and getting involved in violence just like they are in Liverpool or Middlesbrough, they happen to be white, just like men who are beating and murdering their wives. We're only focusing on it when, it when we think it's young black drug dealers and gang members. Violence is an issue that affects many young people and, and adults in this society and we need to get a handle on that and, and, and actually acknowledge that. Right, well that is um, interesting insight, isn't it? I mean, why are the politicians, do you think, not actually responding in the correct way on the basis of what you said? Because when violence is outside of London, again, there's no votes for it. They're poor, deprived place in Middlesbrough, in Liverpool, no one cares. The only reason why it becomes an issue is because we think we have the bloods and the crips in London, young black people, and young black people in crime, just like young Muslim people in terrorism, radicalisation, it gets people's attention. It gets people to think, ooh, what's happening here? And, 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 and rather than looking at the bigger picture, violence in society affects all layers of society, address it. Right. Do you think Sadiq Khan could do more? I think he could, he could show more leadership. He could, he could stop, uh, I think, trying to look like the international states, states politician and actually say, this is a, a, a grassroots issue that I need to get my, my hands on and show leadership and vision. Uh, to, to take this issue forward. Right, do you agree with that? 
Well, he's got a very important role to play, but so has the Home Secretary, so has the Prime Minister. But this is the blame, this this is the blame this game again, no, isn't it? No, but with respect, this government, it took such a long time before they took on board the Windrush case, the scandal that has erupted. The same is happening with knife crime. So we need the government to take responsibility and work with the Mayor of London. He's offered to do that and he is showing leadership, but he needs the government to be a partner in addressing this problem. Brian, was rolling back stop and search in the first place a bad idea? What you need to make sure is that you are targeting criminals, no matter what colour that the, the person's skin is. You, the police have failed to explain why nationally you're eight times more likely to be stopped and searched if you're black than if you are white. And the way to accurately target stop and search is to get the intelligence from the community. To do that, you need more community policing so that the trust and confidence is built, so that the members of the public... You know, th these knifemen, they, they don't keep conceal their knives all the time. They mm. threaten people with it. They stab people with their knives. People in the community know who these people are. They just are frightened. They don't trust the police enough to come forward and point to the people who the police should be stopping and searching. All right, thank you both very much. We'll be returning to this very important issue, no doubt, very soon. As the Conservative government struggles on with the slimmest of parliamentary majorities, the Prime Minister may look in envy towards a handful of Labour councils in London that will be governing with 100% of the seats. But is it healthy to have one-party councils? Tanjal Rashid reports. Much soul-searching in Labour after their party's failure to make the gains they'd got rather excited about making in the local elections. But that disguises the extraordinary hold Labour have over parts of London where they govern with little or no opposition. There are now three one-party councils in London and others with a tiny handful of opposition councillors. The Electoral Reform Society has been researching the impact that has. We know that councils that have been controlled by a single party for a long period of time actually end up making poorer procurement decisions. That's bad for the taxpayer. We also know that they're more at a risk of corruption. But they're offering a solution. Well, we'd like to see the single transferable vote used. That's where voters can choose to put a preference against their candidates. It means that you get more of an accurate match between vote share and seat share. So majority parties will still have a majority in those areas, but they won't have one of these fake super majorities. Barking and Dagenham is one of those one-party councils. Labour have won every single seat here in the last three local elections. You actually have to go back to 2005 to find any opposition councillors elected. That opposition was formed by the BNP. Their vote has since completely collapsed, making the thought of electoral reform a whole lot more palatable, not least to the one in five voters here who supported the Tories at the polls but don't have a single Conservative councillor. The leading local Tory is urging the Prime Minister to take action. I'm going to appeal once again to my party not to be so wedded to the first past the post system at every single level of government, no matter what. A democracy can't really be working if you've expunged the opposition. But they do keep voting Labour back in time and time again. Maybe they think they're doing a good enough job without any opposition. I'm not saying that there should be some kind of conservative putsch in any of those boroughs, but what, we're clear, what is clearly the case is that there are substantial minorities of voters who don't feel as though their council is being held to account. In Islington, the sole opposition councillor managed to hold on to her seat. When you have one party in control, it's very easy not to listen properly. All the strategic conversations are going on within the Labour group rather than within the town hall. So politics is happening behind the closed doors of the Labour Party right now? It is, because there are, there are 47 Labour councillors, and so by the time anything comes to the scrutiny meetings at the town hall, it's already been through, you know, the, the Labour, Party, um, Labour Party processes. Newham is the strongest of Labour strongholds with all of the seats and three quarters of the vote. But the local MP, who also used to run the council, believes Labour councillors provide enough opposition already. I wouldn't want people to take away the view that a one-party council is necessarily a bad thing. It's always been the case, there's been a lively policy debate within the Labour group of councillors. And when they see the results of that over the last four years, they decided, yep, we're going to back Labour again. While there is some appetite for reforming local government in London, even among London Tories, 
changes would have to be legislated by Parliament. And that would mean MPs voting often against their own party's interests, whether that's Labour MPs loosening their grip over certain councils in London or Tory MPs paving the way for an opposition in one-party councils of their own. Meanwhile, with London politics becoming increasingly polarised, there may be many more one-party councils to come. Rishanara, we heard in that film that one-party councils make poor procurement decisions and are often a risk of corruption. So there's nothing to defend them for, is there? Well, my council, Tower Hamlets Council, had uh, a different party, an independent party, that took over uh, the mayoralty and had some councillors that the courts found were corruptly elected. So um, the idea that mainstream parties um, are in that position is, I think, is very problematic. I think this whole well, debate is problematic. it's not mainstream parties, it's just having one, you know, party dominating the council entirely, 100%. Um, the evidence seems to prove that that doesn't make for good government. Well, I, I think the evidence is pro here is quite dubious, frankly, because, you know, in local authorities, in my council, um, we had huge amounts of instability until recently, uh, three years ago. So the, the question should be about accountability and transparency and scrutiny, uh, both from within... Uh, um, within the council, those who are in the back benches, but also from the media. If you've got strong local media um, exposing corruption where it exists, which is what we had with the independents when they were in power in Tower Hamlets, that exposed them and the corruptly elected practices uh, that brought a mayor down. Um, you need that sort of scrutiny. And I think getting into the debate about STVs is actually problematic. So the for single local transferable government. vote. Would you be a fan of reform in that way? No. Why not? Because I, I just don't think it works. What I would be a fan of, and, and I approve, I don't have a problem particularly with 100% of one party. What we, I really require is really good councillors who actually stand up and say this is wrong within a yep. party. Yep. And that is happening. But how, can then... you, but how can you know that that is happening if there are sort of private meetings, particularly between uh, party members of the same political party? Well, I mean, uh, one way of doing it is to go and listen to some of the council meetings where they're in open yep. forum and you will actually find in strong yep. Labour or Conservative um, Conservative councillors standing up so I don't agree with that. But what or about in areas where it is 100% uh, Labour controlled for example uh, what about the voters who are disenfranchised who who don't get the councillors that they want? Well I'm afraid that is democracy that is actually as it works I, I personally do not want uh, any kind of change to the voting system I think it's fine it may not work for us sometimes it may work uh, against us here often but equally I feel what we want is top quality councillors sure well, every, well, no one's going to disagree with that it well, just depends how you judge well I can quality. tell you if you go to the council meetings listen to what they say and they don't necessarily agree with the leader but it wouldn't work in Parliament would it no opposition you know no sort of healthy competition within the council to make the right decisions well, well look we had a referendum for AV for national Parliament and the British people decided they didn't want to reform the national system never mind local systems but could it work so the locally? question well, I'm not sure because I think one of the issues is around turnout, for instance. So I think if we, if people want to engage the public, mm. we need to improve turnout in sure. local elections. Right, because the turnout, we, what was it, 36% in these in recent some, local in elections? In some places, 25%, yes, not, in in certain, yes. not in London, but elsewhere. So turnout's really significant. I think I think actually strengthening the powers of committees and backbench, backbench members is really vital. Um, I think looking at mayoral systems, we've had a mayoral system uh, in my borough, Newham is a mayoral system. System. That can serve communities well because it gives uh, where it, where you've got a, a good group of people running the council, but it can be also be problem problematic. So you have to have much more scrutiny all right. uh, built into the system. Well, that's all we've got time for uh, today. My thanks to both of you for being my guests. Uh, and